Hello and welcome to Psych Boost. In this video we'll be looking at animal studies of attachment and two very well known studies, one by Lorenz and one by Harlow. Our key terms will be imprinting, critical period, contact comfort and maternal deprivation. We'll also discuss some other ways we can extend our evaluations and we'll also look at some evaluations that we can use. So let's have a look at animal studies of attachment. So first up is Lorenz. He looked at a process called imprinting amongst grey lag geese. Now grey lag geese need to leave the nest quickly. And from an evolutionary point of view, their best chance of survival is to follow their mother around closely. So they go through a process called imprinting. This is a very strong attachment to the first object, which is usually the mother, that the baby goslings encounter. This infant animal will then follow this object wherever it goes. So to test this, Lorenz set up an experimental procedure. A grey lag goose's eggs were divided. Half were hatched by the grey lag goose, but the other half were taken away and put in an incubator. Now the goslings that were hatched by Lorenz saw him first. What happens is these goslings would follow Lorenz wherever he went. They wouldn't follow their biological mother goose. But the gosling that hatched naturally, they imprinted on the mother and followed her wherever she went. Now something that Lorenz would do is he'd put all the goslings in a box together, put the box upside down, and then lift it up. What would happen is even though they would all be mixed up, the goslings that would imprint on Lorenz would go to Lorenz, and the gosling that had imprinted on the mother would go to the mother. Now what this research suggests is that the process of imprinting is a strong biological feature and it serves an evolutionary purpose. And that when a bird imprints, it's based on visual cues of the first large object it sees. It's not based on other potential cues, such as the biological smell or sound of the mother goose. Another finding for Lorenz was that he noted that there was a critical period. Now this was around 32 hours. If he waited beyond 32 hours, before he allowed a gosling to see a large moving object, it was too late. These goslings would then not imprint on any object at all. Now these ideas of a critical period would go on to influence later theorists such as Balby. Now on to Harlow. Harlow didn't agree with the cupboard love theory of attachment. The idea that babies love mothers and attach to them just simply because mothers feed them. Now Harlow didn't study on geese. Geese are evolutionarily quite different to humans. Harlow studied with rhesus monkeys who from an evolutionary perspective are very close to humans. Now Harlow's experiment focused on contact comfort. And I'll let Harlow explain his experiment to you. Let me show you a monkey raised on a nursing wire mother. Now here are 106's two mothers. As you can see, it was weaned on a wire mother. Here's baby 106. Watch. He's going to the wire mother. He's got to eat to live. Going back. He's back on the cloth mother and he'll stay on the cloth mother. Actually, this baby spends from 17 to 18 hours a day on the cloth mother and less than one hour a day on the wire mother. We had predicted that the variable of contact comfort would be a variable of measurable importance, but we were unprepared to find that it completely overwhelmed and overshadowed all other variables, including those of nursing. Frankly, doctor, if it comes to a choice between wire and cloth, it's reasonable to expect that any child will go to the cloth. It's a matter of creature comfort, like a baby with its blanket. But is this really love? Well, what do you mean by saying that a baby loves its mother? Certainly one thing we mean is that it gets a great feeling of security in the presence of the mother. Now, Mr. Collingwood, wouldn't you say that if you frightened a baby, that it went running to its mother, was comforted, and then all the fear disappeared and was replaced by a complete sense of security that that baby loved its mother? 
So let me break down Harlow's procedure to you. In one of his experiments, he studied attachment in 16 newborn rhesus macaque monkeys. Now they're taken from their mothers very shortly after birth and they're placed in cages. Now inside these cages were subgroup mothers. Now these 16 newborn macaques were placed in a range of conditions and each of the conditions had a combination of some wire mothers, some cloth mothers and some both. And the surrogate mothers either provided milk or they didn't. So some of the wire mothers provided milk, some of the cloth mothers provided milk. But some of the more interesting findings were that the monkeys who did have access to the cloth mother always preferred her company, even if there was a wire mother in the box as well, and the wire mother provided the milk. Those monkeys that did have access to a cloth mother also did show uh, additional confidence in new situations when put into a playroom, and they would return to it like a normal mother in situations that they might have been frightened. But those monkeys that were given no cloth mother only the wire mother showed real signs of distress. In fact, going on to develop stress-related illnesses. So what does this suggest? Well, it suggests that at least rhesus macaques and potentially other primates like us humans, we do have a biological need for physical contact and we'll attach to whatever provides that comfort rather than attaching to whatever gives us food. Now this goes against the cupboard love theory of attachment. And in one way, it's quite a powerful study because it separates the food and the comfort that usually come together in a package whenever we think about mothers in animals or humans. What Harlow also found in follow-up studies is the monkeys that he caused to have maternal deprivation went on to have very long-term and permanent social problems. They had difficulty mating and when they did mate they had difficulty raising their offspring, in some cases killing their offspring. Now in this experiment, this is the apparatus we use. That looks diabolical. That's just the way the baby monkey feels about it. Flashing eyes, loud sounds, moving mechanical parts, all of these things are designed to frighten a monkey. Now here we have a peaceful, resting baby monkey. Let's find out what his reactions to his mother are when we frighten him. He's scared all right, and he does what any child will do in a similar situation. He runs away. It's more than running away. He was running to his mother. So what you saw there was one of the conditions of Harlow's experiment in which the monkey was intentionally stressed out. Now there have been serious concerns about ethics in psychology and Harlow is often raised as one of those experiments that went too far. There is no doubt that these primates suffered a lot of stress and potentially emotional suffering similar to what humans might feel in that kind of situation. Some of Harlow's other experiments which you could research are actually more extreme and his body of work led in part with other studies to a negative view of what psychology was as a field of research but ultimately did change ethical standards of research and certainly Harlow's studies would never be allowed today. Another criticism is while at the beginning of the video I said rhesus macaques are much closer to humans than grey like geese, they're still very different to humans. We have significant differences in our biology and we have very significant differences in our cultural and social environments. So there are serious problems in generalizing Harlow's findings to humans. We've criticized Harlow's research quite heavily, but we could see an advantage. Harlow's research has been applied to many areas of early childhood. So for example, the contact time between mother and babies in the first few hours after birth has been rethought and given a high importance in hospitals. Social service workers, when they investigate cases of infant neglect, understand the long-term damage that could be coming from this. And also Harlow and Lorenz's research went on to influence later researchers such as John Bowlby and Mary Ainsworth. And it could be argued that the long-term benefits that millions of human infants might have gained through changes in hospital procedures and social work procedures might have ultimately came in part from Harlow's research and this might justify the studies being conducted from a cost-benefit analysis perspective. 
I really hope you found this video useful in studying psychology. Three things help this channel grow along. Likes, comments and subscriptions. Thank you so much if you've done any of those things for this video.